Um, and I am going to hand off the uh, yeah uh, digital round of applause here. Um, and then I'm going to hand the reins over to Meredith. Uh, Meredith Frey from Sarah Lawrence College, who's going to be taking over presiding the next session. Take it away, Meredith. Okay, thank you, Tor. Um, so, basically, uh, our next session, we're going to get to explore some more about online labs and we are going to look kind of specifically at some example labs that people have used. So our first speaker is Nicholas Nelson um, from the California State University of Chico. And he's going to be talking about the not so simple pendulum. So uh, Nicholas, feel free to take it away. Okay, well, thank you. Um, let me share this thing. And there we go. Okay, so uh, this is a this is a example, uh, as Meredith mentioned, of a lab that that uh, that I did I've done previously, and I did last semester, and um, and hopefully will be uh, instructive as sort of an example. Um, so uh, the background here: this is from a calc-based introductory mechanics class for science and engineering majors. Um, there are the students are put into lab sections of 24 students each, which is where we do this activity. Um, there are several lab sections per lecture section. Um, and then um, normally over the course of the semester, the students have used Python. Um, the basically what they've used Python for is plotting and curve fitting. Um, the it's minimally altering code. They generally have to change their, um, they have to change the, the input file that they're reading from. They have to change some bits and pieces of the graphs and they have to change the mathematical form of the function they're fitting to. But other than that, the code is pretty much built for them. And this particular lab, the learning objective here is we wanna try to use an experiment to distinguish between competing theoretical models of a physical system. And our physical system is a pendulum. So uh, the, the goal of the lab is, as we give it to the students, is very simple. Their, obje their objective is to prove that a damped pendulum is not a damped harmonic oscillator. Um, we've introduced to them the concept of a, a pendulum right? And they've already talked a little bit about a harmonic oscillator. In this lab, we introduced the concept of damping. Um, and we point out that an ideal harmonic oscillator will just bounce back and forth forever. But of course, they know that doesn't happen. Um, and so we talk about why that is. And we talk about the damping term. And we tell them that basically what this boils down to is uh, we have a, a equation that they can derive that looks like the equation on the left here, um, which is the, the full pendulum equation. And then we say, okay, if you say that sine theta is just a theta, you get the equation on the right, which is the damped harmonic oscillator. And, um, and then uh, we talk about how they, uh, they, can, they can, they have now two models for this pendulum and which one is correct and and can they prove it um one of the things that uh, oftentimes we don't realize uh, the 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 natural thing is we say well it's the small angle approximation right the way you tell them that they're the two models are different is by going to bigger angles um but it turns out that for angles less than about 90 degrees you can actually get a good fit with the damped harmonic oscillator model by increasing the, the period of the damped harmonic oscillator. So that, that functionally means lengthening the pendulum. So, um, so how do you prove that a damped pendulum is not a damped harmonic oscillator? Well, the way they do that, of course, um, the, the equation that they have to solve, uh, they can't solve either of these equations. This is first semester. They have done integral calculus, but they have no idea what a differential equation is. 
And so I tell them, don't worry about it. Mathematicians know how to do it. A couple semesters in the future, you'll know how to do it. Um, but a computer can do it. And so to them, the differential equation solving is a black box. But basically what I tell them is, we have a computer program that will solve these two equations for them. Um, in face-to-face -face classes, we do this using Python. Um, I've used both the Jupyter Notebooks and the Spider IDE. Um, in both cases, it's minimally modifying code. And this, uh, they will put in some parameters and they will, uh, the code will solve the equations and plot them out for them. The in-person version, they work in groups of four students. Um, we use two of our three-hour lab sessions for this lab. Um, the Python is set up on lab computers, so they don't have to install it on any of their own machines. They can run it all on the computers that we manage for them. Um, and then and generally the student issues are help with the code. They will modify the code in some way that it no longer works. Um, that was referenced earlier. That's the easy syntax fixes. Um, they often have the problem that was also mentioned earlier of selecting the appropriate data. They will try to fit a uh, damp pendulum to the data that includes before they started it swinging, um, which of course goes poorly. And, um, and then of course, the, the big thing that we want to spend time on is understanding the connections between the models and the data. Um, and that's, that's something that takes a lot of discussion and uh, a lot of discussion between themselves and between me and the various groups. So of course we moved online, whether we wanted to or not this past semester. And that threw up a whole bunch of problems. You can't physically work in groups. You don't have the sensors that we use. Uh, the pendulums were built by simply swinging a, either a vernier or a PASCO uh, wireless sensor back and forth, which we have a lab set of. Um, but obviously with the students don't have those. Um, they don't have Python installed and I do not want to be tech support for 24 students trying to install Python on a Chromebook. Um, and they don't have the general lab equipment. They don't have uh, clamps and bars to hang things from. They don't have a large selection of um, meter sticks and string and all sorts of nice things. So what was our solution? Uh, the solution was we did this lab at home with phones, Google Sheets, and whatever the students could scrounge up. Um, so as far as taking data goes, uh, this was actually the thing students worried about the most. We told them to attach their phone to something that could swing back and forth. Um, many students did not particularly care for that bit of instruction. I told them that you, if you do it on a carpeted floor uh, and you don't do it 10 feet up, you will not break your phone. I had to actually post a video of myself dropping my phone repeatedly onto my carpeted floor to assure them that it would not break their phone. Um, we used the, uh, the North Carolina State's uh, MyTech app, but there are others. Um, that, that work the same way. And they take advantage of your phone, in this lab's case, the gyro sensor in your phone, which it turns out is phenomenally accurate and quite precise. Um, so it's a very easy sensor to use. Um, and we simply told them to attach their phone to something that could swing back and forth. Uh, I encouraged them to use rigid objects, but if they didn't have it, they could just tie it onto a string and swing it back and forth, and we could make that work. Um, they could export the data into a CSV format um, and then open it up in a Google Sheets document and edit or and, and clip the data to the relevant portion. Um, previously, we'd done the modeling bit of this in Python. I had them instead do this in a Google Sheets document where I gave them the formulas that needed to be put in. So I gave them a basic version of the, uh, of the Google Sheets um, and uh, that just does a simple um, Euler-Cromer uh, integration. And um, the only pieces they needed to modify of this sheet was they needed to put their own data in columns A and B. 
and they needed to put their fitting parameters into the uh, the entries in in column I, and they just did what I call a chi by I fit. They modified the um, the parameters until they got a good agreement between the data and uh, the the different models. Um, this is for a model where the data is a good fit for both the damped pendulum and the damped harmonic oscillator. And so it would not have satisfied their requirement to prove that the damped harmonic or the damped pendulum was not a damped harmonic oscillator. But um, but they could do this. And the nice thing about this is it allowed them to be iterative. They could generate some data, run it through the analysis, realize it didn't work, decide they need to change something and do it again and again. Um, okay, so the big question, did it actually work? Well, I don't know. Uh, the student feedback was largely positive. Um, their biggest complaint, as I mentioned, was being asked to swing their phones, which they were all very nervous about. Um, I will note that the completion was higher for this lab than any other of the post-COVID labs that we, that we did. Um, more students actually turned in lab reports. Um, and the Google Sheets um, were actually very easy to troubleshoot remotely because they were simply shared with me and then I could see that live. Um, so that was a very nice, easy way to troubleshoot code issues. And with that, I will stop talking. Okay, thanks so much, Nicholas. Um, we have lots of things in the chat about ways of safely holding uh, phones. So uh, in case people are worried and, and their students are worried, uh, check out uh, the different responses there because apparently, yeah, people are reasonably worried about hurting their phones. Um, but in the interest of time, we'll move on, but certainly feel free to add your questions uh, for Nicholas because we'll have the 15 minute panel discussion um, at the end. And I'll introduce our next speaker who's Jennifer Burial. And she's from Moorhead State University and is going to be talking about using videos, spreadsheets and online quizzes. So take it away, Jennifer. Okay, um, so I was just trying to get myself organized. Um, let me share my screen. So this talk really could be um, what to do when you're forced to do online labs and you have no existing online labs whatsoever. Um, so where we are coming from it is a position where we typically had a pretty small faculty for many, many years. Um, and to be honest, we've all been very skeptical about the whole concept of online labs. So I'm going to tell you where we're actually coming from. Um, we have all in-class labs. They are actually decoupled from the lectures um, for a lot of different reasons. Um, the students will come into a lab, they'll work in a group of four typically, and they have an hour and 50 minutes to complete their lab. So at the end of the lab period, they turn in lab sheets. We don't have a formal pre-lab, we don't have a formal post-lab. Um, at the beginning of the semester, they purchase an in-house lab manual, and every lab is self-contained, so it has an introduction, a step-by-step -step procedure, so very uh, recipe-like. And then they have data sheets that they fill out, they do an analysis and they answer questions. This is the same lab, whether you're talking the calculus-based or the algebra-based classes. Um, the calc people just have some more in-depth uh, math they're required to use for some of the questions at the end. So that's how we differentiate. Um, so when we were forced online, ominously enough, it was the morning of Friday, March 13th, right before we were all headed off for spring break. Um, so we had a meeting between the four faculty that were teaching labs and we bounced around some ideas, um, some of which are listed here. Really what we were looking for is we needed something to be accessible to everybody. Um, so we wanted something that wasn't going to exclude someone who didn't have an up-to-date smartphone, for example. Um, we needed it to not add any additional cost because the students do have a lab fee and they do pay for a lab manual. 
And we also needed to be quick because some of the faculty already had spring break plans. And we knew that people weren't gonna cancel their spring break plans to rush to come up with something new. So we decided that our way to uh, save the physics universe was to use the existing lab manual and equipment and have the faculty collect data for the students. Um, and we used little video vignettes where we would introduce them to the equipment. Um, we'd be sure to show them scale markings, talk to them about pitfalls of things that could go wrong during the experiment, and then make sure we recorded trials of us doing the experiment. And then we provided the students with the data to kind of complete the lab. So our idea is that um, they're gonna fill out their lab sheet. The reality is they're gonna have to scan that in somehow. Many of them are gonna do that with a, a smartphone app, which means they're gonna be taking pictures, which may not be um, the best way to do this because the things might get blurry. Um, when you're quarantined with your spouse, who is also a physics faculty member, who is teaching the same lab as you, you spend a lot of time thinking about ways to make things better. And we decided that we weren't really excited about the idea of uploading PDFs and trying to grade um, PDFs. So we personally, since we were both teaching the same um, lab, we were both teaching the second semester intro labs, we were going to try using spreadsheets to replace the, the lab sheets that they would turn in and try using um, the online lab quiz system that was suggested by this physics teacher article back in January of 2020. So we, we thought, well, let's just try this and see where it goes. So we developed an experience where we told the students, read the lab, watch the videos, complete your analysis on this pre-made spreadsheet, and then we would have them upload those as a file response. And then we had a number of questions that they were to answer in Blackboard, most of which were multiple choice, true, false, or fill in the blank. And I have some examples of those if people are interested. Um, so their, their Blackboard view would look like this. Um, they would have their videos. So this is uh, looking at Earth's magnetic field. They had two videos, their pre-made lab spreadsheet, and a PDF that actually had the data in it that looked like their actual lab manual. And then they had a quiz, um, which was really, it was asynchronous. Um, they had as much time as they needed, so we'd give it to them on a Monday and then we would tell them it was due on a Sunday. Um, so we wanted to maximize their flexibility. So for example, for this particular lab, their manual spreadsheet, or their, excuse me, their manual sheet would look like this and we filled in the data that we collected for them in blue. You'll notice all the other things like, tell me the average value, what's the percent difference between the result and the accepted value, et cetera. So we converted that um, to an Excel spreadsheet with something that looked like this, where they were told they needed to fill in all the yellow cells. Um, there were instructions in pink on what they were supposed to do, which is basically use Excel as a um, calculator and a few reminders in orange. So what did we learn? Early on, we learned that what the students were doing is calculating everything on their sheet and then filling in the numbers they had calculated on that spreadsheet. So they weren't actually using Excel to calculate anything. Um, they also were throwing the whole notion of um, scientific notation and sig figs out the window because apparently they didn't know how to control the numerical output, like how many digits they needed past the decimal. Um, many of them were unaware of the built-in Excel functions, so they didn't know there was an average. Um, they didn't know how to handle trig functions. Um, so every time we did something, we had to give them a video um, to watch, preferably no more than about five minutes on how to use Excel to do these new computational things. Um, we also, on our end, learned that it took a little bit of time to convert our questions on the lab sheet, but at the back end, it saved us a lot of grading time. We also, since we got in the lab and sat down and did the labs, we were like, wow, these are not as well written as they could be. So we need to get in the labs and periodically vet those to see that they read as well as they actually should because we're now understanding where sometimes the students struggle. So 
what came out of this was a, a huge learning experience for us in that we were using Excel to have them plot things and fit a trend line, but we weren't really using it as a computational tool. And it's a great way to get computation for everybody, um, just in the, in the lab setting. We like the idea of the online quiz assessment because one of the things we found is that um, instead of all the students getting A's, which is what we were observing, working in a group of four, almost everybody was getting an A. There was a little bit more differentiation between the students who were pretty quiet and just copied people's answers. Some of those students actually, we, we could differentiate who was, who was putting in more effort. Um, and it, again, it does save a lot of time. The video vignettes actually are an opportunity that um, we might exploit in terms of having them do a pre-lab so that they walk into the lab a little bit more informed on what it is they're going to be doing and they're a little bit more effective, hopefully. We'll test that hypothesis out. Um, and it turns out that Ignacio and I are also both teaching labs this summer with our courses, so we've been using some of these ideas there as well. So that's all I have. Any questions? Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I guess some quick questions before we move on to our next panelist was the, what percentage of students watched the videos? Because uh, some people had issues with getting the students to actually watch the videos. So were you able to see how many actually participated and, and watched? To be honest, we didn't actually put any tracking. So I guess in Blackboard, you have the option to see mm -hmm. how many people open it up. Um, I don't know, since we just gave them a video as a file, I don't know if they watched it all the way through. Mm -hmm. um, surprisingly, we had more um, difficulty with them with spreadsheets. And so we were actually getting people asking questions about, well, how do I do this and how do I do that? Even if they had already watched the video online, they were still a little confused, but they also were a little bit more proactive um, in the, at the algebra based class, sending me their spreadsheet and saying, I checked this with my calculator, which was like, wow, you're, you're, you're uh, actually checking the reliability of your program. They were like, I checked it with my calculator and I can't get this to work. Can you tell me what I'm doing wrong in my formula? Um, we didn't really have any complaints at all, except a couple of students who felt that, um, they didn't really have enough experience with Excel, so they felt like it was a bit of a stretch for us to kind of push the envelope there. Okay, okay. well, thank you, Jennifer. Um, our next panelist is and speaker is Wolfram Weinberg from University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point, and he's gonna be talking about multi-view Zoom for physics laboratory experiences at a distance. Uh, so Wolfram. You can go now. All right. I think my video is not going to work, but I'm going to share screen and go to my PowerPoint. All right. And so, let me get this started. I don't see my. Oh, we can see your your presentation, Wolfram. Yeah, I'm not seeing my second screen for my presentation, so that's I need to see this. Oh, okay. I'm not seeing my presenter view, so I'm like this yesterday. Okay, here we go. Okay, um, under the dynamic circumstances of the time, my presentation is uh, going to um, be less about the viewing techniques in Zoom and more about the stay at home streaming of the lab experience in general. I'm teaching at the college um, in uh, Warsaw uh, of the 
University of Wisconsin Stevens Point and our curriculum implements the recommendation of AAPT, particularly collecting, analyzing real data, engineering troubleshooting experiments, using test equipment, and uh, in addition, practice collaboration for assurance of quality and safety. I like this in particular since my background is more in actually um, working real workplaces than uh, teaching um, in academics. So um, when we had to stay home, I found that the unprepared task to transform the hands-on learning outcomes to online presented me with the opportunity to demonstrate to the students how to work a real life crisis and to engage the students in the development and testing of solutions. We already had a lot working for us online. Pre-lab assignments, instruction procedures, templates for the acquisition and analysis, and the lab reports uh, were already processed through Canvas. Now, all I had to do in a way was um, transform the lab activity itself uh, for telecommunication. That meant instead of four or six group of students setting up the experiments, I had to learn to video capture the experiment so that the students could watch what they would be doing in the lab if the, and the students had to learn how to make the measurements um, in an amateur video. In a process of learning by doing, my development of the script for the demonstration and the stage with multiple views were guided by the feedback from the students. So this is a view in my a home office that became a video student uh, studio. And um, I'm using um, multiple cameras to present a good um, impression to the students. So um, we have a camera, let me show you in the, so. This is a camera that usually presents the overview. We have two cameras that we can move around uh, depending on what we want to view. And then um, sometimes I use a false camera. Each camera is um, controlled by a separate computer. We use Logitech cameras with the Logitech software. And so I'm actually moving around between these three computers. Um, I have a headset um, in order to maintain the sound quality. And then I also um, became more and more competent adjusting the lighting, which is kind of a challenge when you operate more than one camera. This is an example. Um, this was actually my first um, test with a student who had missed the lab when we were still on campus. So um, you see here the uh, four views in the gallery on Zoom. Um, the upper left is the overview and then we, I have in this case only um, one uh, detail view uh, for reading the um, data of the of experiment. In my demonstration, I pretty much follow uh, what the students would do themselves in the lab. In the beginning, we explain and um, inspect the components. Um, we do qualitative testing uh, of the setup. If necessary, we do a troubleshooting. And uh, in the online uh, component now, I need to um, double check all the video settings. And then we operate the experiment and collect the data. In the uh, online um, program, the students break out uh, as their teams um, into breakout sessions. Um, usually for the rest of the lab time, which is um, between one and a half and uh, one hour um, for their analysis and completing the collaborative report. 
Throughout the process, the students are encouraged to ask questions and pay attention to my errors and oversights that um, happen frequently because of my being absorbed with the multitasking of running the uh, technology. And then, uh, of course, not to hold back with uh, suggestions how to make things work better. This is uh, an example of the introduction of an experiment using the top view and the side view. Uh, this is a spectrometer. Um, for the online streaming, I have attached a camera to the telescope of the spectrometer. We have a side view uh, showing the log screws uh, for the manipulation of the angular position of the telescope. And um, then we have a camera here that views the angular scale. And This is the gallery view in uh, Zoom, where the students get, again, the overview that shows them the overall positioning of the telescope. And then we have the view at the angular vernier scale. And um, this is actually the operation. So you can see here how I manipulate the um, spectral line into the crosshair. So at this point, yeah, at this point the students uh, take the reading. And this is uh, an example of um, the operation and data collection in the uh, induction experiment. Also, look for a possible shift between the voltage and the current change. This is also an example um, of Zoom uh, taking over the control of the video camera, and that's why this is not as focused as I, it was set up. Um, Note. Sorry, this is the next. Um, this is uh, another example of observing induction. Now when I connect the two coils. So this is an experiment that in the future will challenge the students to use motion tracking software to do actually quantitative analysis. Um, the previous um, experiment, uh, we already used slow motion to answer questions to the qualitative uh, observations. Okay, so uh, in conclusion, the streaming of the experiment synchronizes the students in the observation and data collection and sets the class up to discuss and compare the results of the different groups. This is something I found uh, almost impossible to coordinate during the traditional sessions when people work uh, or the students work independently. On the other hand, the disadvantage in the streaming operation is that uh, the students don't make the mistakes that so often create the valuable teaching ex uh, moments. And um, the students made good use of the team breakout sessions for analyzing and, uh, the results and preparing the collaborative reports. 
And um, at the end of the semester, they acknowledged that we had not only managed the crisis, but also learned quite a lot. And this success would not have been possible without the cooperation of the students in the working relationship that we had established during the labs on campus uh, before. As it seems that hygienic distances is going to stay for a while, I'm looking for ways to engage the students in experiments who have never touched an uh, instrument in their physics lab. The major apps obstacle is that the technical multitasking in the streaming compromises the natural interaction with the students. My plan is to hopefully um, circumstances will permit and that my institution will support a hybrid solution. I envision that one student of the traditional small group conducts the experiments in compliance with the social distancing and workplace hygiene um, in the lab and streams the operation to the group. This way, every student could have an on-campus experience twice or three times during the semester, practice peer instruction, and in the process, learn the skills of uh, video capture and uh, streaming that is a skill they need for their future. Thank you. Thanks so much. That's, that was awesome. Um, we have lots of good questions. So you were streaming this and some people asked uh, if you also recorded recorded the experiments so that students could go back and take data um, from the recorded videos, or or students were expected to kind of take data. Well, the yeah, first of all, the essential components uh, or parts are recorded. Uh, usually, not the troubleshooting because uh, it becomes a very long uh, uh, video and lots of data. Uh, but the uh, critical uh, parts are recorded um, for two reasons. One. Sometimes you want to do um, analysis in slow motion. Sometimes the students want to get, uh, double check their readings, but also um, it is uh, mandated that I create a um, asynchronous pass to the synchronous uh, presentation. So students who are not able to attend actually have access to the recording and get everything they need um, in order to then join their group afterwards again if they want to uh, to uh, do the analysis and the uh, collaborative report. Okay, um, and then one other question: uh, since you had this very nice uh, setup, was there institutional support or technical support that you had access to, or did you kind of have to just make use of? No, I was able to actually convince the administrator that um, this is the only way I could think of. I take the equipment home and do the best I can. And um, apparently my enthusiasm for that um, allowed me to actually, um, you know, take pictures of everything that I uh, needed and before I took home. And um, of course I had to go back a few times because of, but, uh, Yes, on the other hand, um, I didn't really uh, realize what I got myself into um, because this was, a, you know, all day, all night job to get things ready for the, for the scheduled times. And um, one more question. Uh, did you ever have issues with students, um, with bandwidth issues of students trying to access uh, the, the streaming feed? Yes, um, we live in an area where um, a number of the students are first generation, uh, don't have resources. And so um, the library was open for those students to actually uh, use the computers there. And often students couldn't attend or didn't have access because there were other family members um, using their uh, restricted bandwidth. So yes, those were problems. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the next semester, there are all kinds of uh, plans and strategies in place to uh, help the students with that. 
Okay, well, thank you, Wolfram. I think um, now we'll open up to the panel questions. Um, so feel free if you have questions uh, for the panelists, you can write them in the group Zoom chat. Um, I wrote down a few that I had that you all can speak of. So I guess one question I have, um, which some of you addressed, which is very nice, uh, but I know a lot of us are going to be going back to some sort of like hybrid form of teaching. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about how to make sure there's kind of equal access to learning uh, for students who are going to be purely in the online environment and for students who are in person. So I was wondering if people could address um, their experiences with that, if they found good ways of kind of making uh, both cases more equitable or, uh, or things that we should keep in mind. Well, I'll, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll chime in that um, I, I don't know how to make it an equal experience in a lab versus online. Um, I do, um, I, we, we, I mean, everybody's been having these discussions of how do you try to uh, to balance those. Really, it's the um, the online that is the the weak link, right? We we're all much more comfortable, as a general rule, teaching in person labs than teaching online labs. I will say that one of the nice things that I found is, um, and it's been addressed already, is the online misses out on a lot of the social pieces. And there are tools that one can use, whether that's breakout rooms in Zoom or um, message boards um, to try to build community. Um, one thing that I plan on trying this fall with, with my lab, which will be completely online, is fixed lab groups that, um, uh, similar to what I do in person, but we'll put people in lab groups and I usually allow them to switch a couple of times, which allows me to collect all the dead weight into one lab group that then shockingly realizes that nobody will carry them through the labs anymore. Um, but, uh, but anyway, th this, this concept of building a community and building a, a connection um, helps. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know how to make it the same. Well, I don't really know what it is that we want to make the same because nothing really is the same anymore. It's not just in our labs. So um, I think um, the online is uh, the new reality. Um, and um, I think uh, we have to go back and uh, redefine probably the learning outcomes because uh, doing the traditional lab with an inclined plane is really not what is going to help the next generation to solve the problems they are facing. So um, I think there's just um, only no, uh, a lot of questions and no answers. And I'm very hesitant to actually um, at this point, um, you know, come up with this an answer or a plan except for this is a learning process and engage the students. They have different ways of thinking. You know, they go up with uh, gadgets that I didn't even fantasy, uh, fantasize about. Their brain work different, their brains work differently. Yeah, so uh, they need to engage. And I think that means they need to engage online. Actually, can I chime in here? Um, one of the, the things that I noticed is that we had a few students who bemoaned the fact that they were working in a group of four and there was no collaboration for them once we went online. Um, but one of the things that we found from some of the other students is that they connected with the people that they were normally working with in lab. So they were self-actuated to just go out and say, hey, I'm going to make a meeting with the four people that I was already, or the three other people that I was already working with. Um, so I think in a lot of cases, they're, they're pretty adept at going out and finding people to collaborate with that are in the class. Um, but for those who may be a little bit more 
shy, we might have to think about doing things like um, requiring some kind of collaborative component. Yeah, I think I have uh, uh, the exact experience as well. In fact, I was surprised when the students uh, had to um, communicate in the breakout sessions and to share the screens. They never do that in the lab. You know, they all have their own computers or their own notebooks and uh, they never work in a spreadsheet uh, uh, together. But in the breakout session they did, and a number of students did this for the first time, and then they actually looked forward to it. Well, thank you. Yeah, definitely we don't have the answers to all these questions, but I think uh, you, you all make very good points that we have to kind of think about what our new learning objectives are in this kind of new environment. Um, and yeah, we'll continue continue learning together. Um, it's one o'clock, so I can officially end this session. And uh, yeah, if any of the other sure. organizers want to say more. <laughs> thank you, Meredith. And thank you, um, everyone, for such a wonderful set of sessions for this first part of the conference. Um, we'll take an hour break, but uh, we also want to encourage people to um, talk and network if you want to hang around. And so since the webinar does not allow for um, everyone to share their video and, and talk and have breakout rooms, what we've done is we've opened another Zoom session that will be open for the next hour. So um, Danny will post the information on the chat and it's here on um, the screen as well. You will also receive an email um, right about now uh, with all of the information. So for the next hour, if you want to talk to some of your colleagues, please join. Um, this other Zoom meeting, and then we'll be back in the webinar um, in an hour.